Thank you, Connor. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself and my talk here in a minute, but first I wanted to do a couple exercises with you. And the first one's contemplative in nature. So you already seem pretty settled, but maybe just take a little extra time to notice the experience of you in your space. If you're sitting on the floor or sitting in a chair, the experience of that surface holding you up and just what it's like to be in the room here this morning. Perhaps take a few deep breaths. Just relax your body. I want you to think about some aspiration you have, some goal, something you might like to accomplish. Try to bring one to mind. And then think about if you could accomplish that goal, what would that make available? What would it bring to you or your community or the environment, the world? Just get in touch with that. Thank you for taking a moment to do that. Hopefully everybody thought of something. Does anybody want to share what came to mind for them, what aspiration or goal? And maybe if you're online and you thought of something, you could put it in the chat. We won't read them out, but you could share if you wanted to. Second, the second one is just a little bit more interactive. I'm just going to ask you a few questions. You can sort of answer, raise your hand, shout it out. So has anyone ever signed up for a class of some sort and then arrived and felt class or workshop, seminar, and then arrived and felt a little out of place or had that little voice in the back of their head like, what am I doing here? What was I thinking? Or maybe you signed up for like a 5K or something and then you're driving there thinking, holy cow, what did I, maybe you're not saying holy cow, maybe you're saying something else, but why did I do that? So anybody, a couple, I see a couple hands. How about, has anyone ever set a New Year's resolution and started out, you know, very committed to it and then somehow not maintained it over time? Anybody had that happen? Yeah, there are a few hands going up here, yeah. And then I know some of you are new, but others that have been here before, is there anybody that remembers the first time they came to Lion, Lion's Roar, or maybe those of you that are new today, and then you found something about the session or the space kind of strange? Like maybe the prayers seem a little strange or the tonkas or something? Yeah. It can feel that way. So thanks, that just sort of gives, sets the stage for what I hope to talk with you about. My name's Ellen Wolf. I'm a student here at Lions Roar. Um, I attend, I'm a, me a member, so to speak. And I'm a student of the main teacher here who is Lama Yeshe Jimpa. And he's not here today, but a number of us students take on doing talks on a few Sundays a month, so. My talk is called Making the Unfamiliar Familiar. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the experiences I've had, what's motivated me to do this talk, some of the experiences I've, I've had, and the little bits and pieces I've picked up along the way of how one goes about some, taking something that seems difficult or unfamiliar and, and getting a relationship with it, with it where it's familiar, you have ease, or you continue along the path towards some aspiration. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of these things that I've bumped into that I think could be helpful, and then also share some of our teacher, Lama Jimpa's 
thoughts as I've shared with him what I was going to talk about. And then I've um, asked Dirk if he'd comment. He's online. But I know that Dirk, since I've met him, has taken on the learning of the Sanskrit language, which to me seems like one of those things that you might aspire to do, but it's quite difficult. And so he said he'd share his thoughts. And then, of course, we can have discussion as we go. And um, the things that I'm going to fold in came from a myriad of sources, and I'll just present them as I, as I talk. So why do I think this is important? Um, although we have these visions or aspirations, we don't always follow through. And why is that? What makes it hard? And how can we become more successful at following through? And for example, this you can apply this to this Buddhist path that a lot of us are on. It can be difficult, you know, it can feel, so it doesn't necessarily come naturally. It hasn't come naturally to me. And how does one continue on a path? Is this Buddhist path or anything else you aspire to learn or accomplish when, it, when it's difficult? Um, and sometimes when I take something on, the best way for me is to really connect with it, to try to learn what I'm doing, understand it, you know, and, and until I start to have a relationship with it. And that, that can be difficult to do as well. Um, I also think that to accomplish something or learn something, we have to find a way to do it that's gentle, you know, where we don't end up beating up on ourselves or feeling deficient because it's our goal is, you know, out of step with where we are in the process. So, and then, and then just on a grander scale, I mean, yesterday I spent a lot of time outside. It was Earth Day. You know, this is just kind of a crazy time in this world. At a time when, in many cases, um, we have hopes and dreams, and the world doesn't seem to be in the state that we wish it was. So I just think it's so important that to the extent we have those kind of hopes and dreams that we can do our best to fulfill on them. So that's that's kind of the context. Um, okay, so what? why did I pick this talk? In, in the last year or so since COVID, I joined a group, it actually started some time ago, but this is especially came to light in the last year. I started studying um, with this online group, a Tibetan Buddhist online group that did a particular Buddhist practice called Kala Chakra. And they started doing a, a sadhana or a practice that was much more involved than I was used to. And I remember when they first started and I was like, oh my gosh, there's a lot to this. And um, we're on Zoom, you know, so we're sitting in front of our computers. And I found myself turning off my camera, going down to the kitchen to get some coffee. I found myself taking breaks, surfing Amazon, you know, for the things that I wanted to buy. I just, it was so much that I, I almost couldn't be with it. You know, I had to take little breaks and I thought, maybe this is not for me. Maybe I just have to stop doing this. And I you know, tried to hang in there. Um, and then some months later, the teacher said, the fellow that was leading it said, I got it. I'm going to go on retreat. I'm looking for some students to fill in and lead this sadhana. And I don't know why. Well, I do know why. I, I had a choice and I decided I'm going to volunteer to lead this sadhana. And I did that because I knew if I didn't, I would never learn it. And I knew if I did, I would be like really on the hook to try to learn this sadhana. So I did, I said I would lead it and then I was kind of scared to death, but I started spending more time and understanding it better. And little by little, I really kind of got comfortable enough with it that I could lead the sadhana and then I enjoyed it. You know, then I wasn't freaked out by it anymore. And I just thought that process was interesting where I started out in a very freaked out place. And I got to a place where I had some warmth and familiarity with the topic. So that, that was why I decided to, to do this talk. So um, I've actually been fascinated by the human learning process for a long time. When I went to graduate school, I had one particular teacher and he had just written a book that came out and I, I really found the book impactful. And he was studying um, how people learn and how organizations learn. And so some of what I was, I'm gonna share are insights that he had from that. And I've used this book over and over again. His name is Peter Senge. And he wrote this book called The Fifth Discipline. He's, I think he's since written another book. And I think actually there's a newer version of this. Um, but some of the things that he has is that he talks about is that 
there's this natural sort of juxtaposition between a vision or a goal and the current state. Wow, thank you. Dylan predicted when I wanted to show this graphic. He's got this little cartoon graphic in the book. Like we have a vision and then the current reality is someplace different, right? It's by, by definition, it's like that. In between there's this space and there's kind of a tension, right? You wish you were at the goal, but you're not, you're down here. And there's kind of a tension in there. And um, Peter Senge calls that a creative tension. And that absent the creative temp tension, there's no, um, there's no motivation to act. So it is this gap that ca calls us into action. So that's a, a good thing in a way. But sometimes we get confused because the tension, we think it's emotional tension because we have these experiences. And if we collapse it with emotional tension, then it can be uncomfortable. So one of the tricks is just to maintain a certain amount of creative tension without collapsing it with what we might think of as some other emotional distress. Um, and because what happens if you have this gap and you collapse it, what do you wanna do? When you feel that tension as emotional distress, what's, what's, your, what's your motivation? is it's close the gap somehow, right? It's close that gap. And if you can't get proficiency fast enough, then there's a tension to erode the goal, essentially. It's maybe what happens to us um, with New Year's resolutions. You know, I'm gonna start running every, every day, I'm gonna go run 20 minutes. And that's a lot, right? And you start stressing out about it pretty soon you say, well, maybe 18 minutes is enough or maybe every other day is enough because it's easy to er erode that goal. In fact, Senge talks about this dynamic, and Dylan, if you can put up that second graphic, he uses these figures that are called causal diagrams, causal loop diagrams, which I very much enjoy. <clears throat> I was thinking about this. These causal loop diagrams are kind of a little bit like dependent origination. You know, things depend on one another. And so this top circle talks about this gap. It, if you feel emotional tension out of this, you have this gap between your vision and your goal, you feel this emotional tension, there's a pressure to, to reduce the tension. And so you tend to reduce the goal. Whereas this countervailing loop, the bottom one, says that the tension also can motivate us to act. But the problem is this delay is shown in there. A lot of times our actions don't have immediate payoff, right? So the bottom loop takes time it takes time to, to come to fruition. And so one of, the, one of the insights from this, I think is you gotta hang with it because you can take the actions and be moving towards the goal, but it doesn't automatically pay off. And what you wanna do is keep the vision really strong and not let yourself drop the vision. So thanks Dylan for showing that. Um, another author that I like very much, he's actually a, a Buddhist system practitioner, activist, her name's Joanna Macy, and I've talked about her before, so maybe some of you know of her. Um, she wrote a book, let's see, I have a picture of it here, Active Hope. She's written several books. I have it on my Kindle, and this is a bad picture, but if anybody wants more information about it, I can share that. And I wanted to just read a little quote from it. She says, to remain motivated during difficult times, we need to really want our vision to happen. When what we hope for seems beyond our power, however, we are likely to hear a voice inside of us saying, there's no point in even thinking about this, it isn't gonna happen. To hold on to an inspiring vision, we need to stop ourselves from shooting it down inside of our minds before it has a chance to take form. She also says, if nothing is inspiring is on the horizon, we can easily fall back into apathy and resignation. She's, she's sort of saying the same thing. These goals and visions are important. They, they inspire us to act. But we don't want to just, you know, undermine our ability to follow through by not waiting long enough or not sticking with it long enough. So mastery of this creative tension requires some perseverance and patience. And um, to further make matters worse, there's kind of an underlying human nature belief we all have, or many of us have, that we're just not capable. And um, Peter Senge writes about this as well. And Dylan, there's a third cartoon 
So, okay, so here's your vision again, and here's your, yourself working towards this vision. In the background, a lot of times there's this belief like we're, we're not capable, we're not powerless. And, and that, especially if unrevealed, can sabotage our ability to progress. And he's showing these, like, think of these as big rubber bands. He's showing them opposing like this because the other problem is once you get closer to vision, what happens with this tension, with these underlying beliefs of inadequacy, they get stronger and stronger and stronger. So we can get, be moving in the right direction, but this pull back of there's no way I can do this, I can't understand, I can't run the 5K, it just gets to be a big thing in our minds. The only thing to do about these beliefs in powerlessness and unworthiness is to keep taking action and having successes. They're very hard to change over time, but one key in the short run is just acknowledging that they're there because they're there, whether we want them to be there or not. And if we know they're there, then we understand what this pullback is keeping us from uh, succeeding in our goals. Okay, so that's kind of a, a deep dive into some of the dynamics. I was gonna talk a few about a few other attributes of familiarization, um, what I think is relevant. And one of them is gentleness. It was interest, it's interesting about when you agree to do one of these talks that usually Patty recruits you to do, you know, there's kind of this, oh, crap, you know, oh, crap, feeling like I got to sit up in front and talk in front of everybody and talk. But once you pick a topic, I find little things start showing up in your life that are relevant to that topic. And I think that's one of the designs of this process by our teacher is to help you integrate and fold things in. So I was um, in a retreat with a fellow by the name of Robert Thurman. He's a professor out of New York, a very famous Buddhist Eastern studies professor. He's written a lot and does a lot of talks. And when he was talking about these practices, sadhanas or practices that we do, he says, especially tantric ones, a kind of practice we do, he says, he said that what we're doing is familiarization. And that was uncanny to me because I'd already sort of picked that concept for my talk. He said, so it's like you're entering the family. Essentially, he says that you have bodhisattvas or um, aspirations of being helpful to humankind. You have these bodhisattvas aspirations. And in that sense, we're family. We're a family of people on this earth interested in helping other people. And when you do these practices, you're like entering that family. Kind of gives me goosebumps just to think about it. We're Buddha daughters and Buddha sons. And this familiar sense, I think, cre does create this sense of warmth about it, you know? So when you think of getting familiar with, with something, you can think of it as entering this family of people that are interested in accomplishing sort of these shared visions. So again, I think there's, it's this gentleness that goes with it, or the right balance between challenge, taking something on, and then having the resources or support to accomplish them. And uh, maybe some of you have heard about this concept of the zone or the flow channel. Dylan, if you want to show that that graphic. So, you know, you hear about athletes or artists being in the zone or being in the flow. And one of the concepts behind this flow channel is it's the right balance of challenge and capabilities. And when you're in that flow channel, things just seem to go very smoothly. But if you don't have goals or aspirations that are beyond your capability, then you can fall into this boredom or what Joanna said, that lethargy in action. You can be kind of below the line. If you take on too much and don't have the resources or don't move gently up this channel, then you can find yourself stressed out, you know, overwhelmed, and, and the, the idea is to move back into where you have more support or you're not taking on so much as at once. So this idea of um, gentleness in what we do, I think is important and, and then staying in that right sweet spot. Thanks, Dylan. Um, another piece of this, I think, is recognizing ourselves or appreciating the payoff as we go. So we might want to become enlightened beings, but if we actually have to wait until we're enlightened to appreciate the payoff, we got a long wait. At least I do. Maybe you don't. I do. But this concept in Buddhism, there's kind of a concept of the union of wisdom and bliss, which means these are the, are the union of, yeah, wisdom and bliss. So we're 
getting wise over time, but we're experiencing the joy from that as we go. There's a warmth or even a bliss if we take care to notice our positive experiences along the way and not just some big payoff. Um, another fellow that I got to know a little bit, he's written a book, his name's Chad Ming Tang. And he was an engineer at, at Google, but he was a Zen Buddhist and he started trying to figure out how you share Buddhism to, to the masses. And one of the things that he realized is you have to, you have to get these bits of joy as you go. And he wrote a book actually called Joy on Demand. And I have this one too. It's a fun book. He's a fun guy. He, he likes cartoons in his books too. In fact, if I can read this, the, the subtext on the top, this is warning. Side effects may include radical reduced sufferings, persistent signs of resilience, and previously unimagined success. So, um, but what I think is cool about what he figured out is that you can kind of jumpstart a practice if you build in, if you front load the joy. If you just wait until you've mastered something to appreciate it or be joyful from it, then, then it's a long wait. But if you build it in as you go, it can really have a payoff. He says, uh, when, when the mind is at ease, joy becomes more accessible. So part of the practice is learning to access the joy in that ease, and then in turn, using the joy to reinforce the ease. The key, he says, is a joyful practice. Joy and meditation form a virtuous cycle wherein joy becomes very accessible with a trained mind. And that with training, the mind learns to access inner joy with increasing ease and frequency. At the same time, the joyful mind is at peace and a peaceful mind is easily focused and a focused mind becomes more and more trainable, making the practice sessions even more effective. So he's talking particularly about, say, learning to meditate or something, but it can apply really to anything that if you can appreciate successes along the way, it really helps fuel it can give you more energy and capacity to move forward. But he says it requires uh, what he refers to as a gentle ramp up, kind of what we were just talking about. Um, an intensity that is slightly higher, but not too much higher. So again, this idea of, of being real kind to oneself. And he, he quotes some research that found with only 100 minutes of doing something, 100 minutes of practice, that one can start to access the joy and experience the side effects of joy. So it doesn't take much. I think it takes mostly just looking for it. Um, and he writes about familiarization too. The more, he says, the more the mind is in contact with any mental quality, such as calm or joy, the more familiar it becomes with it. And the more familiar it becomes with that mental quality and more quickly and easily it's able to get to it. So again, this idea of like trying to accomplish something, appreciate it, accomplish something, appreciate it. It just builds, builds on it. Um, so part of this too is persistence. You know, we can't give up along the way. We have to keep doing that and looking for those things. And it reminds me of an analogy that um, Lama Jimpa uses sometimes. He's probably used it three or four times since I've been studying with him. He talks about, it's like in front of you is a black curtain. And every little thing you do is a pinprick in the curtain. You know, any 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 merit, meritous action or study or practice is like a pinprick. And you can imagine you have a black curtain, one little pinprick. It doesn't make very much difference. It still looks quite black. But he says you start getting these pinpricks, and pretty soon you can see through this black veil, and eventually you get enough pinpricks, and the veil falls away altogether. You know, and a lot of times in this practice, we're doing one of these and one of those and one of the, and you can't really see how it fits together. But part of it's just having faith that you're doing something and it's making that pinprick and ultimately you'll start to get clarity from it. So it's just keeping putting one foot in front of another with, without stopping. So I wanted to share a, a, a story about a woman that I became familiar while I read her autobiography. Um, uh, I've been recovering some, from some injuries. And so I've been into these comeback stories, you know, people that fall off mountains and recover or people that get hurt or whatever. 
So I read this book by this woman, Hillary Allen. She wrote a book out and back in 2021. Hillary Allen was a PhD student in neuroscience and um, biology at the University of Denver, Colorado. And she started running to break up the monotony and stress of being in the lab. And she really liked running. In particular, she liked trail running. And she got really interested in this. And she found this kind of trail running called sky running, which I gather is like running up the, the edges of cliffs, you know, running up these tall mountains, which you can imagine in Colorado. So she started sky running. And in 2014, she entered the US sky running trail series and she won. And then she got sponsored by North Face and um, she went on to do more of this running. And by 2017, she was ranked number one sky runner in the world. So she was really into this and she sort of changed her expectations about her studies and decided to get a master's instead of a PhD and when she was doing this running thing, then really it was fueling her. So she went to do this really hard sky running race in um, Norway. I think it's Tromso sky race in Norway. And she said, she woke up, she felt really good. She's running up this mountain. She's getting close to the end, she's winning. And she said, all of a sudden she felt the earth give way from her foot and the horizon turned upside down. And essentially she fell off the side of this cliff. She fell 150 feet. She hit six times on her way down. Luckily a runner behind her saw her fall and scampered down to help her. And some photographers who were down below saw her and came up to her. And she lived, um, she was helicoptered off the mountain into a hospital. She had broken 14 bones. She'd broken her back, both feet, both wrists, a lot of bones. Um, about two weeks later, she got flown back home because North Face hired a private charter jet to get her home or she might not have made it home. She couldn't walk. She was in the hospital. Eventually she got home, but she, she couldn't walk. And for her, the worst thing was the doctor said she'd never run again. You know, And she kind of asked herself, why didn't I just die? Now I'm in this state, I can't even take care of myself and I won't be able to do the thing I really love. So she got is sunk into a really deep depression. Ultimately, she said she got on her scooter. She had one of these electric scooters um, and she took her scooter down to the coffee shop with her journal and she started just going there and journaling. And she sort of shifted things in her mind. She tried to figure out how she was gonna come out of this. And she wrote down some aspirations couple of them were, this will make me better. And I am certain that my best physical and mental days are ahead. Not how she could tell that. I'm sure she didn't have really a lot of evidence of that. She just declared that. She started doing exercises, working with a physical therapist. She writes about her first exercise, which was just turning her wrist. You know, very arduous and not really connected to how she's ever going to walk or run again. But she started doing that and just started working and working and working at it. And I wanted to just read you a passage that she wrote. She said, in my head, I pictured myself building a brick house. I was at the beginning of the process, building the foundation, laying each brick by hand and adding the next. Methodolo methodologically placing it and cementing it to its neighbor. If one brick dented or chipped or had a little crack in it, I didn't care. I placed each imperfect brick in the foundation because next to the others, the flawed brick became become stronger, reinforced, better. Each brick was like a day in my recovery. I was building something. I just couldn't yet see what it was. Each piece was contributing to a bigger picture and a greater story. Doing the work and showing up each day, laying each brick gave me hope that I was building a strong foundation for a beautiful, imperfect home. You know, I, it was weird. I was reading this book kind of unrelated to what I thought my talk was to be, but she just, just talks about just keeping going. And can you imagine when you can't walk, you can hardly take care of yourself and you start doing these things just with these aspirations in mind. So she did walk within eight months, she was running again. And she went back to these trail running and back to Norway actually and did that race again. And there are a lot of interesting qualities of her kind of come back. It changed her outlook on things. And she's 
like I said, written this book and done TED Talk. So really interesting. But I was fascinated by this just like one step at a time quality to it. Okay, so I wanted to share some Alama's feedback. I talked to him about these things that I was planning on talking about, and he didn't disagree with anything he said. He went back and said, ground, path, fruition, you know, sort of endorsing what I was talking about. But he added something I would have never thought of, and but I, I'm really glad that he brought it to my attention. Well, with respect to what I've said, he said, we should expect resistance. Tantra, especially, is the right amount of play and tension play and tension between polarities, any opposites, stillness, movement, permanence, impermanence, emptiness, appearance, stretch, twist, spiral. He said, he said, it's like moving a refrigerator by walking it. You know, you don't like pick up a refrigerator, move it. You like rock it from foot to foot. And that's the way you get it to move. Um, so like I said, he didn't disagree with anything, but then he said, then there's the leap, the pop, the leap, or expression when you can be full embodied and complete. So he all of a sudden he says, oh, you know, there's sort of these step changes is what he's saying. It doesn't have to be this, uh, you know, sometimes you can be moving along and then all of a sudden, boom, you see a step change. He says, the teacher is helping you to energetic action and strategy, like bouncing on the diving board, bounce, bounce, bounce. Now he said this, he said, you need a lot of foreplay. Without the buildup, you can't have a nice dive. And you also don't wanna be pushed. He said, so it's like this gradual approach, but you're supported, supported. We have to feel the initiative. He said, usually when we're going along, it's too flat. It's either too flat and we're just, uh, or we get pushed, which nobody likes to feel that pushing. And that can be traumatizing. And then we don't feel our agency, Lama says. And he says it's difficult as a teacher to set up the right amount of his tension, you know, the right amount of support and, and motivation without feeling, making you feel pushed. So the other thing that he said that I thought was fascinating, he says sometimes these leaps or changes happen when you stop. You know, I think it's kind of like stopping resistance or stopping trying so hard. Um, you know, we're always looking for the way from point A to point B. And we don't always have that. We don't always have the ladder to get from point A to point B. But we just have to have faith that we keep practicing, you know, and then we'll have the, the, the chance. He talks about crevasses, you know, we're going along our path and then all of a sudden there's a giant crevasse and what do you do? But hopefully the training and the support of the teacher will lead you to feeling comfortable that if you jump, you can make it across the crevasse. And that's, I think that's part of it. Um, and I, I think what Lama Law talks about too is what scientists refer to as discontinuous change. And Joanna Macy, who I mentioned, also discusses this discontinuous change. Sudden shifts can happen in ways that surprise us. Structures that appear as fixed and solid like the Berlin Wall can collapse or be dismantled in a very short period of time. An understanding of discontinuous change opens up a genuine sense of possibility. With discontinuous change, a threshold is crossed where rather than just more of the same happening, something different occurs. There's a jump to a new level, an opening to a new set of possibilities. Even when we don't see a visible result from our actions, we may be adding to, to an unseen change that moves the situation closer to a threshold where something crystallizes. She refers to the fact that um, ice can break glass. Or, I'm sorry, water can break glass. So you wouldn't think water could break glass, but when it's freezing, you know, it's sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, and then all of a sudden it expands and breaks glass. So these thresholds, I thought that, that's pretty interesting because we don't, I don't think we normally think about that. We think we got to keep it banging our head against the wall. And if the wall is not giving, it's just not going to hard to give. We don't think that boom, someday there might be this big change. So that's really what I prepared to, um, to share. And I hope, Dirk, that that's a good entree to what you might tell us about your experience with learning Sanskrit or maybe something else. And then 
while he's talking, maybe others can think, have they had similar experiences where they took something on and then did find themselves progressing or didn't or so happy to have others share as well, but I'll be quiet and let Dirk share. Uh, th thanks, Elma. I wasn't really sure <laughs> what, what I would, I, I haven't thought about it much. <laughs> um, of course, you know, I'm almost 70 years old and uh, for somebody my age to take on a language as difficult as Sanskrit is, is already maybe arrogance. <laughs> um, but I found, I, I should say that I, I, I studied Sanskrit with a, uh, Kind of a world-renowned teacher named uh, Antonia Rupel, who wrote the uh, Cambridge Introduction to Sanskrit. Uh, she teaches. She has taught at Oxford and Cambridge, and she's and Cornell, and she's currently teaching at LMU in Germany in Munich. And uh, I studied the Sanskrit classes with a. Uh, an organization called yogic studies so this is a, a class that you can take without any you know there's no testing or anything you can just decide to take it and take it but you'll get the same sanskrit course that you would get if you went to oxford basically um and uh there is regular testing so for me i always wanted to learn sanskrit i also knew because i studied ancient greek when i was young um, I knew how hard it was going to be, uh, and so I never made a commitment to it. And so the the thing that you talk about that that commitment thing, it's almost like a sweet spot can open up for something that you really want to do, uh, where you feel that you're willing to do what it takes in order to accomplish it, even though it has long felt like something that's too hard to do right now. I can't do it. I got too many other things going on. Because the fact is, if you enter on something like that, you're going to have to give up stuff. That's something that we don't tend to think about, is that when you, if you want to commit to uh, something big, you're going to have to give up something, too. So you sort of have to be willing to do that right from the get-go. Otherwise, you'll be, you know, it's happened to me, you know, I think, oh, I'll do this. And then, you know, uh, then all these other, there are all these other things you do, too. And that you're, you have commitments to, and that that uh, that that other other people want you to do things. <laughs> In my life, that's largely what happens: is that I've got a lot of other people who want me to do things that they want me to do, or that I've got other commitments that somehow expand. They, they expand at different times, and they take more time at different times. And so to enter something like this, this kind of study required that I uh, actually say, okay, you know, I'm going to make this a priority. And although it's going to be, di be difficult for me and my memory is not like, it's much harder for me to memorize things than it used to be. Um, but I, I'm a, I'm a good, I'm a good Sanskrit student. I'm, I've been studying it for about two years and I, there's, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a solid Sanskrit student. I even uh, even was able to, you, and, and that's the discontinuous thing that you were talking about. It's like moving along. It seems like I I, I don't know anything. I still don't know any. I still feel like I don't know any Sanskrit. But as Antonia, my teacher, pointed out, well, look how you know about halfway through the course, I'm like, I I don't feel like I know any Sanskrit. And she said examine how much Sanskrit you know compared to how much you knew when you started. It's a huge, huge amount, even that's a year and a half ago, huge amount of difference. And then, and then I was able to, like, there's a, a rule uh, that, that I was given, and I, I, I was interested in this rule. I was interested in the details of the rule, and I just started following it, and I followed it through a bunch of es really esoteric texts, and I found out that the rule that I was given was wrong. So I should have a little confidence. Um, and I think that's, but, but I don't have a lot of confidence. And then, I, and then I'm reading, I'm reading with, uh, you know, I feel like I suddenly now I don't know anything. I see, I see this piece of Sanskrit. I look at it and it's like Chinese to me, you know, uh, might as well be, 
could be anything. I don't know what it says. And then I start looking at it. Yeah, actually, I can start to work it out. It's almost like I have a habit of not knowing it. Which is also a strange thing when you're, you come in, you're talked about the familiarity. I've got a great deal of familiarity compared to what I had before. But I still have this feeling when I look at it that, nope, I'm not going to, uh, there's no way I'm going to understand this. Like I come with this predisposition that I'm not, which is what you were talking about, your, your, that this feeling that you're not capable. Come to it with this predisp this idea that I'm not going to read it. Well, I'm reading the Diamond Sutra in Sanskrit with one guy is a professor, a well-known author of Buddhist texts. Another one uh, who knows Chinese and Tibetan as well as Sanskrit. Another one who's a physician who knows uh, Tibetan and Sanskrit. And another one who knows Chinese and Sanskrit. And now I'm reading with these guys. Another one knows Pali and, and Chinese and Sanskrit. You know, these guys are uh, pretty, pretty, pretty motivated people. Uh, and well, I'm not having a hard time keeping up with them. Uh, at all so but i still have a feeling that i don't know anything i still have a feeling that i haven't learned very much i still have a feeling like it's kind of too hard <laughs> for me that maybe i'm not smart enough to do it you know it's it's a strange thing because on the one so and it's also like when i when i discovered that that error in the rule that i was given and then demonstrated it to the scholars and then the scholars thanked me for pointing it out and then after that i'm like oh well i do know something so now i now i'm arrogant right now now i think i know more than i now now i have now i'm overconfident now i feel like i don't need to work as hard for, for that only lasted five minutes but it, it lasted long enough to experience a disjunction of like going from uh oh i gotta study at least to several hours a day. Oh no, I can kind of blow it off. <laughs> I don't need to work as hard. I, I'm actually progressing really well. It's not anyway. I don't know if that's. I don't even know if I'm addressing what you're asking me to address. But that that's sort of how my experience went. It went from uh, just absolutely not believing I could do it to deciding to do it anyway, to uh, working very hard at it, to feeling like I wasn't making any progress at all to uh, making quite a bit of progress, to, you know, reading uh, parts of the, reading the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana and, uh, and some, uh, some of the, the uh, uh, narrative stories that were written in prose, to working on the Diamond Sutra and some other things, and sort of having a feeling that I know, and the, the, just some Kavya poetry and stuff. And so still feeling like, oh, do I dare, you know, would it be, would I be saying, oh, I know so much if I were to translate what I do want to translate the Nama Samgiti, Manjushri Nama Samgiti Tantra, and the, uh, and specifically the, uh, there's a, the verse summary of the Prajnaparamita and 8,000 verses that I want to translate. So, you know, I think it's about time for me to start doing that. And I, I but I still feel like I don't know enough to do it. So. But it, the main thing I would say that no matter what it is you want to do, it's going to require some sacrifices. It's going to be, there are going to be times that you wonder why you're doing it at all. There are going to be times when you think maybe you should quit. When I think about quitting studying Sanskrit, I go, so then what would I do? And I'll have to start over on something else harder. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Just. I'm done. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. shut up. That's perfect, Dirk. I mean, I think Dirk summarized a lot of things we touched on. Um, and I I really like how he says, I've learned a lot, but I still feel like I don't know anything. I still feel like I can't do it. It's like that nagging voice in the back of our head. It's always going to be there. And we have to just basically, thank you for sharing. Now, you know, I'm going to do it anyway. So that was perfect, Dirk. Thank you. Yeah. Did anybody else think of similar, you know, well, I can't say similar to Dirk. It's hard to re recreate Dirk's experience, but anybody, Susan, some, and anybody else that has stories or else we'll just open it up for a uh, discussion. 
I'm not going to relate a story, but I uh, did notice uh, listening to Dirk, the joy, you know, that he's feeling along the way. I mean, he was definitely feeling a lot of joy. It wasn't so much, and it's a very different thing from arrogance, satisfaction, all of that stuff. He was, I mean, he was joyful. Yeah, Dirk? Yeah, actually, yes. Yeah, a lot of joy. Like, oh my God, I can actually do this. <laughs> I'm this, I'm like, oh, I, I'm I'm reading the Ramayana in Sanskrit. You know, I, I mean, it's 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 while, while slogging through it, going word by word, parsing it out, trying to figure out what part of speech it is, and then trying to figure out how to put it all together because it's really foreign. It's way different from even Greek. It's just, but but putting it all together and then oh wow i actually yes this is great <laughs> <laughs> thanks susan thank you uh ellen and dirt i just uh since you just spoke dirt i just uh i really appreciated like how uh you're doing it and how you uh, confessed or just are so honest to say, while you're doing it and having success, this uh, this nagging voices, I don't, I, I'm not sure exactly what you said, but something to like, I don't know, is it that, was that what you said? Or I don't know how, or or I can't do it. I'm not no, sure. You, I don't you, put it doesn't matter mind. what you say, it'll be right, Patty, because it's just <laughs> the question, you know, it's just, I, I, I don't think I can do it. I'm not smart enough to do it. I don't, I'm, I'm not disciplined enough to do it. I, I I'm I'm not trustworthy enough. Whatever whatever it is you want to say, that's what it is. Uh, that's so helpful because it just it's a lot of freedom in that because you're doing it and just bringing that along, and yet you're doing it with that that just just like a little guest that just wants to hang out while you do it. That's that's how I heard it. Like they're just coming along, you, not necessarily getting rid of it, but you can still do your dream. That's how I heard it. Yeah. This is just on a, another note. Uh, I have tried things in the past in which, in the long run, I realized I shouldn't have been doing it. And sometimes you feel you should keep trying. And then when you finally have a realization that this really isn't right for me, and then you try something else, and then everything goes smoother, then you got the joy. And that's the thing. When it's not right, you get all these obstacles, and you don't feel any joy, and you and then when you try something else, you realize it's going in the opposite direction. And you still have to work a lot harder. This was like I went, went back to school once and I became convinced that I should be taking something I had never planned on taking before and turned out I was right. I shouldn't have been doing it. It was like animal physiology. And, and then I went back to school in ecology and that was just everything went smooth. Mm -hmm. Still, there was work, but sometimes you still have to use a certain intuition about right or wrong. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, point. Um, is this working? I, I have a um, I'm what closer, closer? Yeah. closer like that. Yeah. You mean hold it the right way? <laughs> um, I'm working on some projects at home, and some of them are a little bit intimidating, and there's resistance, and especially one where I'm going to try and totally renew this shed and make it into a workshop. But I find that when I have that resistance, if I just kind of break the task down and go for what I have some enthusiasm for and for what's easy and get that part done. And then the next part kind of shows itself, okay, this is what, what you should do next. And sometimes it's a, just stop and go to the Home Depot and buy, buy something you need, you know, but just keep uh, kind of preloaded with the joyous activities as much as you can. So that you don't just give up and think it's too much or too overpowering. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And the downside of doing these talks is that I find myself not applying my own medicine. 
And I'm like, why am I struggling with trying to master something? And this happened to me recently as I tried to master doing my yoga practice at home instead of doing it only around other people. And I realized that same thing that I worry a lot about all the stuff that's to come instead of just doing a little bit right now and being present to it. It's usually the worrying about all that stuff to come the next day, the next day, then what am I going to have to do? And then it'll be hard. And then, and if I just set that aside and do, you know, the 10 minute task in front of me, it makes it so much more joyful. So I think there is a lot of dread anticipation when you think that you can't do something. So that's an excellent point. Thanks. Now. I appreciate well, okay. I appreciate it when you mentioned discontinuous change, because one thing I wanted, I've been working on with Lama is to try and approach life with more love or more compassion. And there's a lot of times that I do live up to that, that ideal. And then a lot of times I don't, it's like I approach something and I'm a jerk or just very negative and it's not a complete derailment it's just a a falling down or, or falling off the path and the benefit and the the change in my thought pattern is still there and it it's having an effect so i i really resonated with that part and just wanted to let you know thank you yeah and you know and being gentle with yourself for imperfection you don't have to be perfect at everything right some some little bit of benefit like you said is better than none even if it's imperfect so totally totally yeah what's up we got this side of the room we got nothing over here so <laughs> how about anybody online well wait wait we got that other side of the room connor <laughs> yeah uh hello Yes, it's back. Uh, I like what Tom said because uh, I can relate to that. Some someone once told me that um, you you have too many dishes to wash, and you keep procrastinating. And said now is I don't want to do it. So many I accumulate, and then you, he told me can you do one third of it. Can you can you split in three parts and do just one third, and then after that, can you do the second third, right? <laughs> and now, do you have the energy to do the third part? And when you see, yes, you you did the whole thing, and but uh, but I think the what we are talking about is also the difference between uh, knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. So I let's say that I want to be more patient. And I can get a book on that, an amazing book with all this information, all, all I need to know how to become more patient. But that's knowledge, right? Now I know this book. Now I know these ideas. To become more patient, I need to, to practice that in my life, have an uh, experience. And then I need to be patient to do it. <laughs> so, uh, I think it's a big, big difference every time we 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 look to knowledge and and uh, how to apply this this knowledge in in, in our life and, and become part of part of who who we are. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else online in the room? Thank goodness. <laughs> Somebody on the left side of the room. You keep turning it off. Hello. Yeah. Um, great talk. Thank you. Um, really enjoyed that. I, I'm a project based person in my professional life, and I always find just limitless joy in the act of making something um, you, where you forget the anxiety, mm -hmm. you forget the skill, you just are in the act of making. And um, that's where I find the flow. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, for Dirk, you might as well start with number one of 8,000 and uh, get uh, <laughs> get moving because that's where the fun is. Good. Thanks. Uh, I think 
actually, Ellen, the thing that actually struck me the most was that second um, graph, I guess, of the, the tension between the creative the creative cycle and sort of the process cycle. Because um, I actually find that more difficult of trying to work through that creative tension and how that process actually happens. Yeah, this one. Um, and I think what Dirk was saying is that you've got to give something up because those actions are slow and and how do you actually find the time for that? Um, and when we have so much going on in our lives, you know, especially with, you know, which is practice or finding a job or family, you know, there's, there's all these things that, choices that we need to make about what does that creative tension mean to us and what priorities are we putting on all those creative tensions well, there's bands of creative tension that we may have and which one are we going to prioritize and what does that anxiety look like over which band are we going to choose within that process? So mm -hmm. that's a tough one. Warrants a lot of self-compassion, I think. Definitely. Yeah, it's good. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, you're welcome. Do you have anything? Omo araya pazaya na ayindi Om araya pazaya na ayindi